Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to take you on a little journey for the next number of minutes. And that journey is going to talk about disruption, positive disruption, I hope. It's going to talk about communication and the importance of communication and the power of communication. And it's going to talk about using those two things to make a change in probably one of the most important areas that we need to consider whether change is necessary. And that's our system of justice. When we talk about justice, and in particular in my area, criminal justice, we have an expectation that the tools we apply to that judicial process are the best that we can do. They're the very best we can do because we're talking about people's liberty, because we're talking about victims of crime, of victims of the most awful atrocities. And so the science that we bring to this must be the very best that it can possibly be. Mustn't it? Let's take a little step backwards into the history books, just for a small moment if you'll indulge me. And when we talk about justice, and we want to look at where does justice come from, where are its origins, they stem back 801 years, back to the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta was a document that was crafted between King John and his not-so-loyal barons at the time, in order to try to create a mechanism whereby they could communicate with each other, whereby they could talk with each other in a way that was just, where the barons felt that they were listened to and they felt that they were heard. And of the clauses of the Magna Carta, there are three that remain in our common system of justice and our common legal system. Of one of those, the one that's relevant to this discussion, is the one that enshrines the right to people to have a fair trial and to be tried by your peers, people that are just like you. When we go back into the history books and we look back along a timeline and we look at times of great development in our societies and we think about times like the Renaissance where we had huge changes in our cultural and scientific development. We look at times like the Age of Enlightenment where we had amazing scientific achievements moving on into the Industrial Revolution, where we had similar achievements that have created our modern societies, and moving now, now not on into the digital age, where we have our smartphones and we connect to the world. Here's the Magna Carta, right the way down at the beginning of my timeline. Let's think about justice and think about science, and when did justice and science collide? Well, this is where they collided, about 150 years ago where we had scientific disciplines, so-called, beginning to have an influence into our courts. And we had the advent of fingerprinting, of ballistics, of looking at anatomical ways of describing the body that could then be useful to describe victims or suspects, where we had handwriting examinations starting to come into our courtrooms, and then much more frequently, or much more recently, where we've had the advent of DNA technologies. Who are our players? And I hope there are no lawyers or policemen in the audience. Who are our players? Our players are a difficult, interesting mixture of interesting people from different communities. There are legal colleagues. There are colleagues in policing and law enforcement. They are the scientists. And they are you, the public. And we try to communicate with each other. The lawyers have to speak with the with the uh, policemen, the scientists have to speak with the policemen and with the lawyers. It's not always an easy conversation. And we all have to discuss things with the jury, with the triers of fact, the people who go into that courtroom with the remit and with the obligation uh, to make up a decision about guilt or innocence. So let's look at the jury just for a moment. And I want you to raise your right hand. Don't be shy. A jury, when it's impaneled in this country, is asked to swear an oath, and that oath says, I swear by Almighty God, or whatever God you believe in, that I will faithfully try the defendant and give a true verdict according to the evidence, the evidence I hear. You can put your hands down. Let's have a look at this for a bit of evidence. This is a set of statements that was made by forensic experts in a case about craniofacial superimposition. 
So looking at a skull and looking at a picture and saying, could they be from the same person? So I'm just going to put them up so that you can read them. These are sets of statements that were said in evidence by the expert witnesses on the witness box, in the witness box. They're at odds with each other. These are all experts for the prosecution, all for the same side, allegedly. What are we going to do with that? As members of the jury who have promised you have taken an oath to try the defendant and to deliver a true verdict according to the evidence, what happens if we can't understand the evidence? In 2009, over in the United States, the National Academy of Science produced this report. And this report looked at forensic evidence, warts and all, and it looked at the underpinning science behind a whole range of evidence types, some of the ones I've already mentioned. It spoke about DNA, it spoke about fingerprints and ballistics, how we match bullets to guns, how we look at trace evidence like fibers and hairs, and how we make inferences from those pieces of individual information according to our scientific analysis to help the, ju the jury establish guilt or innocence of an individual. And what the National Academy of Science report said was that most of the science that underpins all of this evidence isn't there. It just isn't rigorous enough, or it's wholly absent. And the response within our community as forensic scientists was pretty much that. <laughs> Which is what you'd expect. Because we thought, my goodness me, what are we going to do? We've been relying on this evidence types for 150 years, and now you're telling us that they're not scientific, or they're not good enough, or in some cases, judges have referred to them as no better than witchcraft. So what was the solution? Well, in the United States, the solution was what you would expect it to be. We threw a big, huge bag of money at it. Because if we throw money at our problem, particularly if it's a problem in science, well, we'll fix it, won't we? But we didn't. Because what the money did was it looked at doing a number of studies that simply just replicated and reassured us that in actual fact, the science wasn't very good. And we spent our money doing this, going round in circles. And part of our problem, part of the problem that was identified was that within the forensic sciences and within our criminal justice system as a whole, we worked in silos. And our silos are part of our players. They're the jury, they're our judiciary and our lawyers, they're our scientists, there are law enforcement. Within each of the silos, there are silos. So we have, if you look at just the scientists, we've got biologists and chemists and physicists and toxicologists. And within each of those, we've got specialists, say in chemistry, that do fire investigation and explosives and drugs and don't do anything else. So we have silos inside of silos, multiple layers of barriers to communication. And we went round in circles. And then we went round in a few more circles, and we went round in a few more. And we didn't resolve our problem. But we thought we were heading in the right direction. And then this happened. And for those of you who keep in tune with what's going on with the use of science in court, and some of you will, what was happening next really started to cause us great alarm. Because what was happening next was a much more engaged public and a much more engaged um, scientific community who have, have had a problem identified to them, who are now saying, we're not really fixing this. And not only are we not fixing it in areas like um, hair analysis, or in areas like fingerprint comparison, or in areas like ballistics, we're being told that we have a crisis coming. We've been told we have to change what we're doing. We've been told we have a really big problem. And we're constantly being told that now. And then in 2015, our gold standard, our gold star, the savior of forensic science, because it is scientifically rigorous, the analysis of DNA was brought under question. And in 2015, a judge in the United States refused to let DNA comparisons into his courtroom. 
and he refused to let DNA comparisons into his courtroom because he believed that the science wasn't rigorous enough. DNA is the area that we put most of our, our, our monetary resources into. So we did this. <laughs> and we thought, now what are we going to do? And so the time has come, really, to start to change how we think about what we're going to do across our community. And that change has to be disruptive. Because we sit in this communication piece across law enforcement, science, the judiciary and the legals who present our science in court and the juries who are the triers of fact. We sit across this, this spectrum of individuals who desperately want the science to be right because we desperately want to be fair, but we're desperately bad at communicating it. And so what can we do? And so one of the things that we've started to do is we've started to take a different approach. We've started to look at disruptive um, opportunities back through the annals of history and said, well, how did they do it? Because the time of the Renaissance and the time of the Age of Enlightenment, there was an enormous amount of disruptive change, but very positive disruptive change. So what can we learn from that? And so we went back and we looked at the Renaissance and we looked at the thing called the Medici effect. The Medici was a very rich uh, banking family that was in Florence during the Renaissance. And what the Medici family did was they provided the resources to bring together the scientists of the day, the artists, the lawyers, the designers, the engineers, all of the people that are within our, our spectrum of humanity. And they put them in the same place and they told them to have a conversation. And it was that conversation, unfettered, that allowed huge changes to occur, this intersection of the disciplines that allowed a great opportunity for entrepreneurship and for development. It allowed us to break those silos, to knock the silos down because there are no preconceptions about what people want to do other than be in the conversation. And so that's what we're going to do to try to address our problems. But how do we do it? It's not that easy. Conceptually, it sounds fantastic. It actually isn't that easy to do. So what we've begun to do is we've begun to bring our legal colleagues, the judiciary, and the case makers, the prosecutors, the defenders, together. We've started to bring them together with law enforcement, with the policemen. We've started to bring them together with the scientists, which is really uncomfortable. Because as a scientist, when I interact with the law, I'm usually standing in a witness box. And that's a really uncomfortable place for a scientist to be because it's really adversarial. And we brought them together, or we'll bring them together, with you, with the public, with the school children, to really start to have honest conversations and to have strategic conversations where the most important thing is the resolution of the problem we're trying to deal with. And that problem might be, how are we going to fix DNA? What are we going to do about it? The judges over here don't want to let it in to our courtrooms. The scientists are going, but I've spent so much of my time, career, effort, energy letting it in. Why don't you believe me? And the police officers are going, ah, we thought DNA was going to really fix our problems for us in terms of criminal investigation. How do we get that community to stop thinking about their own part of it and to start working together to resolve it? And what we've done is we've thrown a bunch of entrepreneurs and business modelers into the mix, into the middle of it, because they're making us do things that we don't want to do, like talk about value and empathy. And scientists don't like talking about empathy. And so instead of hating each other, we start to hate the business modelers, and we suddenly start to have conversations that actually mean we're having conversations, and we go, oh, hey, this might work after all. So that's the first thing is to have a conversation. The second thing is to use that conversation to explore what bits of our evidence first started 150 years ago actually have got value today. And we need to look at those evidence types in a way that's truly systematic. So we're taking the same approach across them all. And that's where our scientific discovery will really come into its own. And our scientific methodologies will really work because we're using very similar tools across a wide range of different problems. 
And we need to start asking questions about, is handwriting valuable in a modern era? Should we really be putting our energy and efforts into that? Or should we putting them, be putting them into more into fingerprint comparison? Or is fingerprint comparison archaic now because we all use biometrics? What's important? What value has it got? Why are we doing it? Why are we using it? What's the boundaries around that use? What are the downsides that we need to know about? And so on. And then the third thing that we need to start to do is we need to start to communicate really communicate. Now that we've worked together to identify our issues, to look at how we can strip away our barriers, break down our silos and begin our conversations to bring the best scientists and designers and people from humanities and teenage hackers and school kids together to really tackle this problem, how do we then work on our communication? Do we do it by standing up and talking to each other? That might work. That's what we have to do in court. But what about giving that information to the jury so they understand it? So it's not science speak. It's not gobbledygook. Well, why can't we communicate with the jury in a different way? Why can't we tell them the basic science so that they can understand the issue at hand and the matter in front of them, the in innocence or guilt of the person in the dock, by teaching them about the science in a different way? There's nothing to stop us. We can use comics, we can use games, we can use anything at all because there's nothing to stop us. So the important thing is that the criminal justice system and the end-to-end -end process of crime scene to courtroom needs to be disrupted. That whole ecosystem needs disruption. It needs to be disrupted in a positive way so that collectively, together, the lawyers and the policemen and the scientists and the public and the school kids and the teenage hackers can rebuild it in a way that is really positive and in a way that really allows science to serve criminal justice in the most important way that it can. And then we need to communicate that information so that we can really affect a change. Thank you very much.